Fidel Castro spent most of his life at war with the United States of America. And he leaned forward and put his very long, thin, strong finger in my chest and said to me, I know what US policy is. I have people at the highest levels of your government. Your policy is to wait for me to die, and I don't intend to cooperate. La lucha continua. La victoria es cierta. Patria o muerte. His was a dictatorship that lasted more than 50 years. He crossed swords with 11 US presidents and survived hundreds of assassination attempts and an invasion. For millions around the world, he was an inspiring revolutionary. Castro was an almost mythical figure, a figure uh, worshipped by the left in general, although not without misgivings. To his critics, he was a brutal dictator, imprisoning and executing tens of thousands of opponents. As he famously said once, trust no one. And he did it. A giant of the Cold War, Castro took the world to the brink of nuclear Armageddon. When somebody asked him, what do you think history are going to tell about you? And Fidel said, when? History will in 100 years, in 500 years, in 1,000 years. When? Castro's death has now reignited the debate on one of the most divisive and controversial figures of the 20th century. It's hard to imagine today, but Fidel Castro's relationship with the United States began in 1959 as something of a love affair. New York, Pennsylvania station rarely has seen anything like it. Only the magnetism of a Castro could produce it. Just three months earlier, Castro had taken control of Cuba in a violent revolution. And on his 11-day trip, he wowed America with the charisma that had helped propel him to power. Even a child appears dressed in Castro-like garb. I came for, for good relations, for good understanding, for good <laughs> economical relations. Castro had burst onto the world stage at the height of the Cold War. When he met America's vice president, the big question for Richard Nixon was whose side was Castro on? At the end of the conversation, Nixon wrote that Fidel was a great leader, and it was clear that he was going to be a great leader, but that he didn't know whether Fidel was naive or was a communist. Uh, when I repeated that to Fidel uh, later on, after reading the memorandum conversation, Fidel said, well, I was both, or I was neither. Fidel was not clear in his own mind exactly what he was at the time. His views were just evolving. But the courtship between Castro and America didn't last long. Within months, relations turned hostile, and they remained hostile for the next 50 years. The story of why Cuba and America, just 90 miles apart, became implacable foes is a story of Castro's revolution and how it managed to survive for so long. Fidel Castro was born in 1926 in Cuba's sugarcane heartlands. His father was a wealthy farmer. His mother was a servant on the estate. Castro was sent away to be schooled by Jesuits in Santiago. He's a smart guy. He works hard. He's a star basketball and baseball athlete. And he gets a car from his dad to ride to the University of Havana. As a law student in 1945, Fidel Castro joined the struggle for Cuba's future. Havana University was a cauldron of radical politics of all kinds. There were often violent protests. 
Fidel used to wear a pistol in his belt and so did I. We all had to be armed if we wanted to exercise the right to give an opinion at the University Square. In the 1950s, Cuba was the gambling and prostitution capital of the Caribbean. It was known as the Whorehouse of America. Many of the casinos were owned by American mobsters. Politics was dominated by military strongman General Fulgencio Batista. No one could put up with those conditions of life. Prostitution was a big problem, and so were the casinos. Children couldn't go to school. We, the students, couldn't accept it. In 1948, Castro married the daughter of a wealthy family with political connections. The couple had a son, Fidelito. The ambitious young Castro ran for election to Congress, vowing to clean up corruption. But in 1952, General Batista seized power in a military coup. His new regime was supported by America. Students took to the streets in protest, but were brushed aside. And now there's a government which is not even dressed in civilian clothes. It's a military government, where public freedoms are restricted, and where the only way to change the situation is through revolutionary action. Castro soon became central to the armed resistance against the dictatorship and the Cuban army. In 1953, he launched an audacious attack against Batista's regime, leading around 150 men in an assault on the Moncada army barracks in Santiago. Pensábamos tratar de provocar un levantamiento nacional para el derrocamiento de Batista. Caso de no lograrse el levantamiento nacional, o en el caso de que Batista pudiera re, eh, reaccionar con fuerzas superiores y atacarnos aquí en Santiago de Cuba, la idea nuestra era con las armas del cuartel Moncada marchar a las montañas y librar la guerra irregular en las montañas. But the Moncada attack was a disaster. Around 60 rebels were killed. Castro was captured and put on trial. The trial was a chance to promote his political vision. He was his own lawyer. Uh, he spoke on his own behalf. And his trial uh, defense was then edited and published as a pamphlet that turned out to be uh, effective as a way to describe the political plan for a movement that had never had a political plan. Castro's famous pamphlet was called History Will Absolve Me. History will absolve me, we used to say, was our Bible. It became the country's first constitution for us in the opposition. History will absolve me was where Fidel talked to the problem of the poor, the problem of the schools, the problem of land for the peasants, which was a very serious problem, housing, all those things, which were serious problems. Castro was sentenced to 15 years in one of Cuba's most notorious jails. Years later, he recalled his incarceration fondly. Leía 12 horas, 14 horas, 16 horas. Y después nunca he tenido oportunidad de leer tantas horas seguidas. In prison, Castro decided to divorce his wife and wrote a letter to his sister revealing how hard he would fight for custody of his son. He says, look, I am going to wage um, a war that's going to make the 100-year war look like a walk at the beach. I will never give up 
I will do this, he says, even if the world shall be destroyed in the process. So we have here very clearly in the letters, he tells you, I am a scorched earth warrior. I will bluff until I win. 1955, in an attempt to cope with the serious unrest in Cuba, Batista tries appeasement. A general amnesty frees a beardless Fidel Castro. His brother Raul leaves with him. They are greeted by Released after nearly two years, Castro immediately set about taking on Batista again. And Heidi Santa Maria. He announces that he will leave the country to organize an invasion. Castro traveled to Miami to raise money and to Mexico to put together the nucleus of a new guerrilla force. Among Castro's recruits was a young Argentine doctor. Che Guevara would become a key figure in the revolution and its global face. In built into the Cuban revolution, right from the beginning was a spirit of internationalism that our leaders were Fidel and Che, an Argentinian, so it was a fight not just for Cuba, but the whole continent. Castro's revolutionaries called themselves the July 26th movement, in memory of the Moncada barracks assault. But alongside the armed struggle, Castro was also a master of propaganda, quickly latching on to the new marketing methods of 1950s America. He learned how effective advertising campaigns could be. You could sell soap through adverts or any product. So in a country full of frustration and social problems, why not a political idea? The revolution began inauspiciously in a small cabin cruiser called Granma. Castro and around 80 men set sail for Mexico in November 1956. The boat was overloaded and a 1,200 mile voyage took longer than expected. They missed their intended landing spot on Cuba's southeast tip, ending up in a mangrove swamp. They were ambushed by Batista's troops. Fewer than 20 of Castro's men escaped to the mountains with him. In the Sierra Maestra, Castro once again turned a setback to his advantage. He began building up his motley army. Among his most trusted comrades was his younger brother, Raul, who would be by his side for the next 50 years. Castro won over the peasants who came to support his campaign against Batista. He made a great impression on the people in the countryside. He got along very well with the poor people in the Sierra Maestra. They saw the commander as the person who'd come to bring about agrarian reform. Che Guevara was one of Castro's key strategists. Facing a much stronger enemy, the rebels fought a guerrilla war. The Castro rebels plant bombs and buses on railroad trains. They set fire to cars and trucks, oil tanks and factories. Castro also waged a cutting-edge war for hearts and minds. He invited journalists and filmmakers to follow him. This is only the beginning. The last battle will be fought in the capital. You can be sure. But Batista also manipulated the media, telling a journalist Castro had been killed. The reason Batista did that was he knew that Fidel Castro needed celebrity and fame to exist and to make his revolution happen. So what does Fidel Castro do? He's panicked, he's in the Sierra. He says, oh my God, they're writing I'm dead. And that's when he summons Herbert Matthews of the New York Times, then the most influential reporter in the country, then he does this charade where he turns his, what, 50 troops into, he keeps rotating them so they look like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Stagecraft, propaganda. No one has ever been in his league in that regard. Castro's revolutionary message was left wing, 
but not at that stage communist. There is not communism or Marxism in our ideas. Our political philosophy is representative democracy and social justice in a well-planned economy. Castro's vision struck a chord with many Cubans. That was a very exciting message for a young generation. And uh, uh, so all of us, uh, and certainly the rest of the, of the Cuban people, followed that uh, hope. Batista's henchmen have fled. Towards the end of 1958, Batista lost control of Havana. This was the scene of turmoil in the capital, Havana, as the climax of revolution was reached. Anyone suspected of sympathy for the Batista regime came in for a rough time. On New Year's Day, 1959, Batista fled, taking millions of dollars with him, but leaving behind the trappings of dictatorship. A week later, Castro made a triumphal arrival in the city. It was as if somebody had said a cyclone was coming. But it was a cyclone we had longed for, because it would sweep the rottenness away. Castro's first speech as Cuba's new leader was carefully staged. Before he spoke, they released a flock of white doves. But one of the doves fluttered up in the air and then came back and landed on Castro's shoulder and remained there throughout the speech. The people in the audience were gasping because the white dove uh, is the, the messenger of the gods in Santeria, which is the most powerful religion in Cuba. Uh, the, the messenger of the gods sent to indicate the anointed one. One of the new Cuban leader's first priorities was mounting a charm offensive on American television. Just 30 days ago, Fidel Castro entered Havana to be greeted by cheering mobs as one of the greatest heroes in Cuba's history. Good evening, Fidel Castro. At the age of 32, you now have in your hands a great deal of power and a great deal of responsibility. Aren't you a little frightened by this? Well, really, not frightened, because I have self-confidence. In pyjamas, in his apartment in Havana's Hilton Hotel, it was perhaps the most intimate interview ever given by a world leader. There was even discussion of Castro's famous beard. And my beard means many things to my country. When we have uh, fulfilled our promise of good government, I will cut my beard. Politics was not entirely off limits. The young Castro was asked about his tough treatment of Batista's henchmen. Well, Fidel Castro, what about the trials of Batista's followers? Well, I think, and with my, myself, all our people, that they are just. Not perfectly, because we are not living now in normal conditions. Behind the soft image Castro was keen to project, he was tightening his grip on power. There were show trials and public executions of those suspected of being part of Batista's regime, despite America's condemnation. Castro started breaking up large farms and plantations and handing the land over to Cuba's peasants, just as he said he would before the revolution. But Castro didn't deliver on another promise he had made. We expected him to call elections, and he said that he was going to call elections in six months. But then we heard him on TV uh, on the four or five months, uh, a famous uh, words, uh, phrase that he, he repeated, elections para que. Elections for what? So 
we started realizing that all the things that this guy had promised when he was in the mountains, uh, uh, he was not going to really realize. Robin Day of the BBC asked Castro why he was breaking his promise. You obviously have a great deal of support among the people of Cuba, Dr. Castro. Why in that case do you not hold elections on a democratic basis? We ask it to the, peace, the people. People said we don't want political now because we are working. And political was good only for robbers and for criminals. Fidel Castro genuinely believed that in an important sense, he was always a Democrat. He believed that he had the support of the majority of the Cuban people. But as the nature of Castro's revolution became clearer, many Cubans turned against him, particularly the middle classes. Hundreds of thousands of Cubans fled the country as Castro began seizing private businesses. Most ended up in Miami. What was your position or job in Cuba? I was a manager of a sugar company. And why did you leave? Well, because they took absolutely everything <laughs> of our company. Those exiles felt that things were worse than they ever had been under Batista. And Miami became a haven for deeply, deeply embittered people and who had a lovely synergy with those in power in Washington. Relations between Cuba and America were deteriorating fast. Castro began seizing businesses owned by powerful Americans. In retaliation, the US refused to buy Cuba's sugar or supply the country with oil. It was a huge blow to Castro. Che Guevara was now head of Cuba's National Bank, and in 1960, he struck a crucial deal with America's Cold War rival, the Soviet Union. They would buy a million tons of sugar a year, a lifeline for Cuba. Economics, as well as politics, was propelling Castro towards the Soviets. Soon, Cuba had not just new Russian tractors, but tanks and other weapons too. In March 1960, there was an explosion on an ammunition ship in Havana docks. At least 75 people died. Castro blamed the Americans. Premier Fidel Castro suggests it was sabotage, occurring with the knowledge and approval of the US government. Cuba was on a war footing. America's CIA began targeting Castro. There were plots to kill him using poison pens and pills, even exploding cigars. Castro reveled in the CIA's bungling. And now you don't know the worry at all. It's news. They never understood that the best way to fight Fidel Castro is not to confront him. Because where can he go from there? He wouldn't have known what to do because he needs a confrontation. And that's what the United States were useful for. Fidel loves the US. They did everything he wanted. He's the hero. He's David against Goliath. Deep in the Florida Everglades, the CIA was working with hundreds of Cuban exiles on a bold plan to invade Cuba. We felt that uh, we had to do something. Uh, we had to do something to reclaim uh, the nation. President Kennedy refused to commit American forces, but was happy for the exiles to go ahead. It would turn out to be a huge blunder that Castro would exploit. American bombers painted to look like Cuban planes and piloted by exiles set out from Nicaragua to destroy Castro's air force. But he feared an attack was coming and had hidden most of his planes. 
the Cubans began preparing for a ground invasion. Two days later, 1,400 exiles landed on Cuba's south coast at the Bay of Pigs. Very little would go to plan. I landed in with the first wave. The first thing that I heard was the Viva Fidel Castro. And... Resistance was fiercer than expected. The Cuban Air Force sank two supply ships. Castro rushed to the Bay of Pigs to take command. We had perhaps that night the most intense fight that uh, has taken place in, Cu in Cuba uh, in, the, in the 20th uh, century. Over two days, 70,000 Cuban troops using Soviet tanks overpowered the would-be liberators. 114 exiles were killed. Around 1,100 were captured. The invasion had achieved the opposite of what its participants had intended. The success of the invasion for Fidel Castro gave him a tremendous sense of invisibility and also proved to the Soviet Union that he was somebody that they could trust to maintain uh, the, the, the fight uh, against the US. Uh, and as they turned, uh, they were right. In Cuba, the revolution was gathering support. Castro had a populist touch and was busy attacking the vestiges of privilege from the Batista days. This used to be the luxurious Biltmore Beach Club, with, they told me, an entrance fee of $2,000 and an annual subscription of $200. Nowadays, anyone can come in for a few cents a time. With Castro cementing his power over Cuba, the Americans focused on a covert war of sabotage and subversion. Now he showed how pragmatic he could be. He had come to power vowing he was not a communist. But in December 1961, Castro formally threw in his lot with the Soviets. When he announces on national television that he had become a Marxist-Leninist and, quote, I will be one until the day I die, he also said that he had now finished even the first book of Karl Marx's Capital. So this is not book learning. This is saying, you know, it looks good, uh, good enough at least, and if I'm going to be a Soviet ally, I better say that I'm a communist. The Russians now had an ally just 90 miles from the coast of Florida. Castro became a communist hero. Cuba had become the first communist beachhead in the Western Hemisphere. In response, America tightened its economic noose around Castro, putting in place a trade embargo that lasted more than 50 years. But as the Cold War deepened, Cuba and its newly communist leader would soon bring the world to the edge of destruction. We were this close to nuclear holocaust, and Fidel Castro was the main reason uh, that we're that close. In June 1961, the United States had placed nuclear missiles in Turkey, capable of striking the Soviet Union. A year later, the Russian leader Khrushchev persuaded Castro to allow its nuclear missiles to be secretly sighted in Cuba. That would put Washington in range of a Soviet strike. I worked in a factory that made missiles which were sent to Cuba on the orders of Khrushchev. It was a test to the Americans who had put rockets with nuclear warheads in Turkey. A nice little present. That could lead to a nuclear war. But if we put our missiles under their noses, then maybe they would question whether it was worth it or not. 
the Soviets set about building missile sites in Cuba. But they could not be concealed from American spy planes. They were discovered in October 1962, bringing the two superpowers to the brink of nuclear war. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. US President John F. Kennedy imposed a naval blockade against Soviet ships. Protests erupted around the world. The crisis peaked when an American spy plane was shot down over Cuba. The Cold War was turning white hot. We had no doubts that this could have turned into a third world catastrophe. This was a real possibility, and a single careless step could spark an explosion. Years later, Castro recalled how high the stakes had been. After 13 days in which the world stared into the abyss, the two superpowers came to a deal. Khrushchev agreed to withdraw his missiles from Cuba. America withdrew theirs from Turkey. To his horror, Castro was sidelined. To a certain extent, at a basic level, you could say it was a betrayal. And Castro took great offense at the lack of trust shown by the Soviet Union. Decades later, Castro revealed his own role in taking the world to the brink of Armageddon. When he told us, at the time was really unbelievable. He had sent a message to Khrushchev, which he told us about, in which he said the things about these missiles is that you have to use them first. Um, you know, preemptive strike. And that ironically proved to be one of the reasons why Khrushchev decided to withdraw them. He realized that he was losing control uh, uh, of, you know, at a moment of grave crisis in the world. And that maybe Fidel uh, did not have all of his marbles. Um, and he was right. <laughs> and thank God that Khrushchev was wise enough to do that, because otherwise we would have had a nuclear holocaust. Away from the world stage, Castro was reforming Cuban society. Before the revolution, Cuba had been one of the wealthier countries in Latin America but many of its six million citizens were poor and around a quarter couldn't read. Castro encouraged thousands of young volunteers to travel to the countryside to teach literacy. And he began building a health service. The successes were enormous. First, the entire population was educated. Secondly, schools, universities built to educate their children and grandchildren. Third, the creation of a medical system and a health service that is the envy of most of the world. Castro himself came to embody the revolution. He frequently appeared at mass rallies, making televised speeches of epic proportions as his daughter Alina remembers. Imagine a child of eight just longing for six o'clock in the evening to be able to watch half an hour of cartoons. And this man was talking. He had started at two o'clock and we children were virtually praying for him to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> 
Behind the cult of personality, the Cuban leader jealously guarded his private life. Fidel Castro is a man who's been surrounded by people since the year he was in the Sierra Maestra. So he needs solitude. He's a man who's very private in his personal life. Very, very private. Castro's family was off limits. He's believed to have had 10 children with several women, including Fidelito, who he kept from his mother. His daughter, who later fled Cuba, recalls life with her father. To begin with, I was a very normal girl. And when I had any questions, I would go along and ask my parents, my mother, my father. The answers were always very cryptic and strange. They never really explained anything to me. And so I would let him talk in a monologue about whatever subject he cared to at that particular moment. I didn't have a regular place in his world. Castro's regime persecuted political and social outsiders, including gays and lesbians. He constructed a powerful police state. Fidel was prepared to send people to prison by the tens of thousands and hold them in prison for years and years simply because of the expression of political views or to try to associate to oppose them. This was a ruthless ruler in the way that he dealt with the domestic political opposition. One former revolutionary spent 22 years as a political prisoner after he turned against Castro's regime. Prison in Cuba was a violent shock for us, especially after we had fought Batista's dictatorship, which had been very arbitrary and very cruel to political prisoners. We saw that the very same revolution we had fought for was using the same or worse methods against political prisoners. In one of three documentaries Oliver Stone made about him, Castro rejected criticism of his use of power. Dictator means strong man, yes, dictator, yeah. Yes, in the 1960 to 62 period, some of them had met harsh fates, no question about it. But at the same time, you have to allow that there were people who were not necessarily working in the Cuban people's interest. It was a very tricky time. So a dictator, you can call him that. Uh, it's not a big deal. We've supported, the U.S. has supported dictators, dozens and dozens of dictators in, in most of the countries of the world. The 1960s saw the Cold War expanding into conflicts around the world. The U.S. became embroiled in a disastrous war against the communist-backed forces of North Vietnam. The conflict influenced Fidel Castro and Che Guevara into internationalizing the battle against American global power. The way to fight the United States is to tie it down. As Guevara articulately put it, let us create two, three more Vietnams. Wherever they may be, it doesn't matter. It might be in the Congo, it might be in Bolivia, it might be everywhere in Latin America or in Africa. And Cuba becomes involved in much of the world to try to multiply the impact of the strategy that the Vietnamese had developed. Fight imperialism wherever it may be. Che Guevara went to the Congo where he tried to foment revolution. Then he turned his attention to Latin America. In 1966, he went to Bolivia with a group of guerrillas. He was hunted down by government troops, helped by the CIA. And in October 1967, Guevara was captured and shot the next day. That image of the dead Che was seen in many parts of South America. And people said so, including people on the left. My God, it's like Christ. Castro saw an opportunity in Che Guevara's death. 
si queremos un modelo de hombre, un modelo de hombre que no pertenece a este tiempo, un modelo de hombre que pertenece a los tiempos futuros, de corazón digo que ese modelo es el Che. After Che died, suddenly his face is just everywhere. It's just on every wall, every placard. Who has not seen the dashing, handsome face of Che Guevara on their coffee cup, on their T-shirt? And that was all launched by Fidel Castro. That was taking a Corda picture, and we're going to say, he's going to be our, our global ambassador for the noble revolution and the wicked U.S. who must have been behind the Bolivians in his execution, which to some extent was, was quite true. As America's deepening involvement in Vietnam ignited protests in Britain and beyond, people on the left increasingly saw Castro as a figurehead. Castro was like a David and Goliath situation to America. Here was this tiny country seeking to implement a version of socialism, a version of communism, whatever you want to call it, up against the might of American capitalism, which was doing everything it could to crush that. And he survived, and whatever his defects, and whatever the bad human rights record on the island of Cuba, for which Castro was responsible as well, nevertheless, that status uh, was something that inspired the rest of the left. America appeared to be losing on two fronts, in Vietnam and Cuba. To some American diplomats, the Cold War was blinding the superpower to the true nature of its enemies. Our two biggest mistakes in history were in Vietnam, where we precisely confused communism and nationalism, um, and in Cuba, uh, where we did the same thing. The only way you could have dealt successfully in Vietnam and Cuba is to understand that nationalism is more important than communism, from where they're coming our ability to succeed would have depended on our ability to understand the war that they saw, not the war that we saw. In 1976, a new US president, Jimmy Carter, hoped for a new start with Cuba. He sent Robert Pasta as his envoy to meet Castro. As ever, the Cuban leader was defiant bringing up a US government report on CIA plots to kill foreign leaders, including himself. He started the meeting by reminding us of the Church Committee report on all of the political assassinations. Uh, and he ended a description of those assassinations in the report by then saying, that's only about half of all of the attempts to kill me by the United States. Let me tell you about the other half. Uh, and he did. But over time, the two countries did agree to reopen limited diplomatic relations, short of full ties. Carter relaxed the ban on Americans traveling to Cuba, and Castro released some political prisoners. He was always a tough negotiator. He was a powerful attorney, advocate. He could throw out five arguments, and you get the feeling as if he was tying you in a knot and then he would pull it tight. Uh, brilliant, just brilliant at times. President Carter's effort to engage with Castro ultimately ran into the sand. In the end, for Castro, cooperation with America was more dangerous than conflict. Castro had much greater possibilities in his eyes to not normalize relations when the potential existed. Because the risk of normalizing relations with the United States is significant. Will they be able to control the country so tightly with an influx of American ideas, money? I think it would be very, uh, very difficult. And therefore, Castro is, has other priorities. Castro continued to impose himself on the international stage, 
this time thousands of miles away in southwest Africa. When apartheid South Africa tried to destabilize the left-wing government of Angola, Castro sent in Cuban troops. Around 10,000 Cuban soldiers are believed to have been killed in 14 years of fighting. In 1988, Castro took charge of the war from Havana for the decisive battle of Quito Cuanivale. La lucha continua. La victoria es cierta. Patria o muerte. Cuba's intervention helped defeat South Africa in Angola. It also hastened the end of the apartheid regime that had survived for 40 years. On his release, Nelson Mandela acknowledged the debt the new South Africa owed to Cuba. It's a very great moment for us to be visited by Fidel. Because uh, what he has done for us is difficult to put in words. Cuba's involvement in Angola was absolutely decisive because they defeated the apartheid war machine, which had never been, the South African forces had never been defeated before. And it became a major issue in the subsequent transformation from the tyranny of apartheid to the free democracy that we see in South Africa today. But there was little sign of democracy in Cuba. Even a popular hero of the Angolan War was not safe from persecution. It was the show trial that shook Havana. In 1989, General Arnoldo Ochoa was controversially convicted of drug smuggling and corruption and was later executed. When General Ochoa, the hero of Angola, was condemned by Raul Castro at Fidel's behest and put to death. We all figured he did it because he was a potential successor, because Fidel never, ever puts up with potential successors. Ochoa's death shattered the life of one of his friends, the Cuban writer Norberto Fuentes. He had been part of Castro's inner circle for a decade. He recalls a fateful meeting with the Cuban leader after Ochoa's execution. He gave me his hand. How are you? He said, I'm well, Commandant. How are you? I'm well. He looked at me. He take my measures. I said, he's taking my measure for my coffin. Was what I think. And I know that it was the end. Fuentes tried to flee Cuba, but he was caught and jailed. Castro let him leave the country after he went on hunger strike. Now living in America, his reflections on his life under the revolution reveal the extraordinary devotion Castro inspired. Fidel said something one day. I'm going to say it in Spanish because I want to say it exactly as he said. Aquellos que han renunciado a su historia han desaparecido. Despite everything, Fuentes still won't denounce Castro. Nada. Nothing personal, no suffering, no jail or dead friend has diminished my sense of history. Ha logrado disminuir mi sentido de la historia. I'm not an enemy of the revolution. How can you be an enemy of an earthquake? Now Cuba faced another seismic shock. For 30 years, Castro's regime had been sustained by Soviet economic help. But under the new Russian leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, that began to change. Communism was collapsing across Eastern Europe. When the Soviet Union disappeared, so did Castro's lifeline. The majority of industrial facilities in Cuba were financed by the Soviet Union, were manned by Soviet specialists, built 
with materials supplied from the Soviet Union, and suddenly all that stopped. Cuba, from an economic point of view, seemed to fall into the abyss. No support, no resources of its own. Cuba's economy collapsed. Without Russian economic support, ordinary Cubans were thrust into poverty. Castro blamed the ongoing US embargo for the country's desperate situation. Castro was forced to compromise with capitalism, allowing some private business and opening the country to tourism. But Cuba was on its way to becoming the third poorest country in Latin America. As the crisis worsened in 1994, thousands of desperate Cubans tried to flee. The latest in a long line to risk it all in the Florida Straits. Under Castro, around a sixth of Cuba's population went into exile. We really don't know how many deaths there have been of people who were trying to escape from Cuba. Imagine how desperate you have to be to get hold of an inner tube from some lorry, throw a sack over it and try to cross 90 miles of shark-infested water. But it's easier to do that than to rebel there. It's more likely that you'll survive that than taking part in an armed uprising. But Castro's international isolation began to ease in the late 1990s as a string of left-wing governments came to power in Latin America. The newly elected leaders of Brazil and Venezuela were among those who paid their dues to Castro. Lula flew to Havana, met Fidel many times, likewise Chavez. And for the first time since the Cuban Revolution, the whole of South America recognized Cuba. So the Cubans were suddenly joyous. Venezuela's leader, Hugo Chavez, became Castro's closest ally. He gave the struggling Cuban economy a new lease of life by supplying cheap oil in return for help from Cuban medics. Castro found admirers among a new generation of Latin American leaders. All these regimes had come to power through democratic elections. None of them had come to power via an armed struggle, and Fidel understood that the continent was changing, so they were less isolated from 2000 onwards than they had been for the uh, uh, preceding 40 years. Castro never lost his eye for a powerful image to promote his regime. He invited Oliver Stone to film a visit to a Cuban medical school for his documentary. His message was clear. After 40 years in power, Castro was still father to the nation and the continent. I don't know what picture people draw of Fidel Castro, but those people who've met him would generally attribute warmth to him and curiosity about the human condition. He's a man who's truly interested in people because he knows he lives in a bubble. So in a way, he's trying to reach out of that bubble. Castro's health had always been treated as a state secret. The first sign he was not immortal came while making a speech in 2004. Those pictures were very damning to the image of Fidel, the eternal, vigilant, ever healthy soldier, comandante looking after our country. In 2006, Castro had intestinal surgery. Power was gradually handed over to his younger brother, Raul. Clearly, Fidel did not want to do it, but he was forced to. He couldn't appear in public, and he was really compelled to do it. And, but he didn't really want to do it. As Fidel Castro's influence waned, Raul sped up the economic reforms. 
and in 2013, the visit of Barack Obama saw the easing of US sanctions and the restoration of diplomatic ties between the two countries. It remains to be seen whether Obama's successor, Donald Trump, will maintain this new relationship. Castro was rarely seen in recent years as his health declined. His death has now reawakened the controversy over the legacy of a popular revolution and more than 50 years of authoritarian rule. The world has rarely seen leaders like that. Think of individuals who shaped their country as completely as Fidel Castro shaped Cuba. And there aren't many people like that in the history of the world. Castro was the last of the original Cold War warriors. Unlike many, he survived the collapse of the Soviet Union and remained an icon for left-wing movements around the world. What I would say is one of the giants of the 20th century, a major figure in South America and, you know, the rest of the world uh, too. And within the continent itself, Fidel will be seen as a gigantic continental figure of the type that only South America can produce. He won, definitely won, and he knows he won. They didn't kill him, they didn't intimidate him. He never bowed down, he fought on his, he stood up and died on his feet. He didn't live on his knees. Castro once claimed history would absolve him, but for some, it is his human rights record that will also define his legacy. History will record that this is a ruler who did many good things to transform his country. But anyone who imprisoned so many, who caused the exile of a sixth of his population, uh, who executed so many and who committed unspeakable crimes in the name of democracy and socialism, no, I would not absolve him. I, I don't think history would. People remember what he did for health care and education in Cuba, uh, and they will also remember a completely self-destructive economy, uh, and they will remember years of conflict with the United States. History absolved his desire to rid Cuba of the Batista dictatorship, but it did not absolve his own dictatorship. <laughs>